about it. talking before about um, what your situation was and the main thing that I want to get to is there's been new developments and I just kind of like to start there and kind of expand from there. Okay, well like I had mentioned earlier we acquired this building in 1994 and we were across the street. We were in 159 and we purchased 162. We made application for a mini grant to expand into the new quarters, and, and we were awarded the mini grant. Then we attempted to move into 162 Broadway, and we were denied because church was a prohibited use in the C1 zone. So from 1994 on through 2000, I attempted, without first going to sue the city, to resolve those issues. That's why the downstairs front of the building. 1,500 square feet of 10,500 square feet we offered to the city as a retail outlet. Because that's what they wished to take place down here. So we figured, well, you know what, we'll give up the store and allow us to operate on the second floor and in the back of the building. That didn't work. Eventually, unfortunately, we came to a place in time in 2000 that we needed to file a lawsuit. We had applied for a variance. They never even listed us on the agenda to be heard. We never were given a fair hearing. So we were fortunate enough to retain an attorney suitable who filed in, uh, federal, in actually we filed in state court here in Freehold um, violations of our constitutional rights as a church. The city's first response to our action was to have it kicked up to the federal court. So from June to 2000 when we filed until our September of 2000, we were operating under violations of the first, I believe the 14th civil rights and others, um, until actually uh, President, former President Clinton signed into law the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act in September of 2000. So we, we amended our original complaint to include a violation of that as well. Uh, not being a lawyer, uh, the best way for me to explain what took place from 2000 through 2005 is just an enormous amount of paper being filed with the court. Uh, it took five full years to finally come to the day when, in fact, um, a judge rendered some type of a decision. And that decision was based on responses to summary judgments that were filed by the city to dismiss all our claims. I think part of their uh, request was based upon we didn't discover any evidence to um, being mistreated or violated in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing I may say is that during that five years, the city would not allow us any discovery. They kept ducking that issue. Why so, do you think that is? Oh, the cities? 
I think because they didn't want us to have the appropriate information to prove what they were doing to us. And was that legal to, for them to keep that information from you? Well, if they purposefully denied giving us that information, that would be illegal. Um, as a result of their maneuvers... Can you... Uh, the reason why I want no, to again, with sure. that is because most of the time people talk about like you know the things that happen, mm -hmm. and we're trying to create an understanding for the lay person mm -hmm. or the person who's about to go through eminent domain. Mm -hmm. What kind of tactics are actually used? Like in other words, what did the city do? Like what kind of things did you have to go through when you felt like okay, I wanted this information, but why can't I have it? Okay, well, originally uh, when discovery was allowed by the court, originally the city actually filed a motion asking that discovery be stayed until the preliminary issues were resolved, and it seemed as though that helped them. We never got a chance to depose any of the important decision makers from the city, yet we were forced to be deposed. I personally was deposed by two different lawyers on two separate events, and we complied, we went in and we were deposed. Now I would ask my lawyer, why am I being forced in for deposition and we haven't been able to get the mayor in for deposition, or the planning board members in, or whomever? Why can't we get them in? And my lawyer would just coach me personally, well, you know, let us be in compliance. If they want to escape, eventually a jury will see that and hopefully rule in our favor. At the end of that discovery process, interestingly enough, then they, before they had to be held forcefully enough to produce documentation, um, on one event they were. They were admonished by the court and, and we were, weren't given anything. We were allowed to go to City Hall and, at, and look through City Hall records to see if we found anything. Were you able to make copies? Yeah, yeah we were afforded the opportunity to make copies, for which we had to pay for. Um, and we found some interesting things, a letter by the mayor congratulating us on the mini-grant, which we didn't have, how they handled other religious organizations in the zone, which were contrary to how they handled us. So in any event, in December, uh, December 7th, 2005, what should have been a trial turned out to be, uh, through a pretrial motion, summary judgment requesting dismissal of our claims predicated upon we haven't been able to produce any evidence that what they did was wrong and uh, the C1 zone was changed. It was now the redevelopment zone. So the claim in our original brief was no longer valid and the judge went with it and granted summary judgment to the city. We lost. December 7th, 2005. Immediately interested national parties, the Department of Justice, the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, because of the RELUPA issue, Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, along with our attorney, Michael Kazanoff and Red Bank, they conferenced. They themselves could not allow this decision to stand because it would have national impact in such a, a new federal statute, RELUPA. So we were fortunate. Uh, they came in and they handled um, an appeal. It was a narrow appeal. They didn't appeal all the issues that concerned us. Like eventually, when you don't, originally, when you don't allow uh, a missions operator to exist, he doesn't get paid. I don't get paid. I haven't had salary for, I don't think I've ever drawn salary from the mission, to be very honest with you. Uh, the three years that we were non-existent, uh, we had zero revenue and income. And the negative cloud placed upon me personally, the Reverend Brown, who founded the Lighthouse Mission, caused people to say, well, you know what, we may not know all that the city knows. All people know is if he is a reverend and it's a legitimate church organization, how, they, they can't be stopped. So obviously they know something about this Brown, and that was a real negative impact on us. But uh, thank God, you know, if I guess I can say this without prejudicing anybody's faith, if uh, God being for us, we, we were able to survive those five years. And subsequently, filing that appeal, uh, we got heard in March of 2007. Arguments were conducted by the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty in the court in Philadelphia, Third Circuit Appellate, and uh, Director... Uh, 
of uh, civil rights housing came up from Washington for the Department of Justice and argued on behalf of Reluper also. So that decision came out Tuesday. And uh, we were vindicated in part. And what was the date on that? Uh, the 27th of November, 2007. Uh, almost two years after the fact, so it's another, in the five, now there's another two years throw on top of that, that we haven't been able to use uh, our building as church. Um, we've used it for other things, the retail store, of course my residence is upstairs, even though they gave me a ticket for using the residence upstairs. Um, uh, the conference hall, I, believe me when I tell you, we, we were much like the early church you know, ducking the Romans. We, we, we did what we did because the need of people in the community was, was more important to us than the law. Anyway, come this last Tuesday, the 27th, uh, the decision of the three-judge panel went two judges for, one against. Judge Roth wrote the opinion saying that the C-1 ordinance, the zone, violated our constitutional rights. Can you explain what the C-1 ordinance is? Uh, the, C1 ordinance is the zoning ordinance for the area that the building is in, commercial, commercial zone one. And they found it to be in violation of our constitutionally guaranteed rights. They should have allowed us to open. So from 1995 through 2007, that prohibition is now going down to the lower court to be cited uh, on for damages only and legal fees. So it becomes a monetary thing. Where they fell short and disappoint us is that even though they found the underlying zone unconstitutional, they're finding the redevelopment of the zone not violating our constitutional rights, and the plan prohibits us as well. And we're now forced into uh, carrying this battle and argument into the eminent domain arena, which has been what I felt they were going to do to us anyway. Um, I don't know, but I'm pretty hopeful. I'm thinking it on a layman. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a constitutional expert in any way, shape, or form other than the eight years of my life in this issue and all the things I've had to do and learn just by reading briefs and you know, signing certifications and going to hearings and listening to judges and other learned people who uh, contended our issues or supported our issues. I kind of feel... If you read the dissent of the decision, and it's a published opinion, it can be, uh, anyone can get it online. It's the Lighthouse versus Long Branch. Um, judge, Circuit Judge Jordan wrote the dissent. He affirmed the part that called the C1 zone unconstitutional, but he uh, uh, dissented to the part where they stopped at the redevelopment zone. He truly believed, the Jordan dissent believed that both the zone ordinance and the redevelopment plan have violated us and we should be allowed to open and it shouldn't just be a monetary thing. Um, but now, let's go to the Kilo versus New London issue, if I may. Um, out of that decision comes a very important legal precedent. The states are free to more restrict what the U.S. Supreme Court didn't in the Kilo versus London, which for the last two years has sent states into this quick hurry, let's protect our property owners or let's help our developers, and they've come up with many different state laws overseeing the protections of private property. I like the way our courts in New Jersey have gone in the last six to seven months. There have been seven rulings on this type of seizure. Six have gone for property owners, one has not. Each, of course, has its own individual dynamics. In the Broadway Arts Center plan, which is, we've challenged, um, which is also on appeal at state level, and in January we now go as defendant in the first action the city's filed to condemn the building. I mean, they lost under the C-1. They won under redevelopment so far at federal. But my point here is this. Follow the logic. And again, it's my opinion. The federal court had a decision to make. And the mind of government and courts today, which is totally baffling me, is they believe if both sides of the issue walk out of the courtroom unhappy or displeased, they've done their job. Now obviously with winning half and losing half, both parties walk out of that process unhappy and everyone thinks, 
justice was served. Well, excuse me. If someone has been violated and justice is to make right, there's got to be a victor and there's got to be a loser. Try putting that logic into the Super Bowl, that both teams walk off the field unhappy. It doesn't work. That logic is flawed in and of itself. So now, but taking it and trying to justify these learned circuit court judges, because I was impressed with their ability to think and make decisions. I just wasn't happy with the total decision. Could they have been saying, okay, there's a controversy in Long Branch. Long Branch wants to economically develop the lower area. And specifically the reason why they gave Long Branch the right to take us out was because of a state statute that allows for uh, restriction of alcoholic licenses, liquor licenses, from being within 200 feet of the front door of a church. In that statute, 331-76 New Jersey statute, there's a provision that a church can waive that right and permit to have liquor licenses right next door to it. So there, there's, your, there's the thing right there that solves the issue. And we, of course, we're in an urban environment. And we're in a, you, would you? Of waive? course. And we let the court know that we would. And so they had that before they made their decision. But they were not persuaded they were with us in our argument that we would waive because the city's argument then was, well, that would have to be done annually for 15 years. And after 15 years, if a church has, in fact, waived that right continually for 15 years, they never have to be asked again to waive it. Wait, wait, why, why would you have to waive it? Why is it annual versus the idea that you one would, time and for why, all. Why would it be one time and for all? And then, if you wanted to make a complaint, then you could make a complaint. But, like, I don't understand the procedure. Well, because the license, as I understand it, again, being a layman, mm -hmm. the license, and I did read the statute very thoroughly, the license is renewed by the municipality or the state or the county who's ever going to control liquor licenses for the area annually. Uh, so, at the annual renewal, it would require a signing off of the police department signing off a of fire and code, signing off of the ABC board if there is one, the council if provisions are made for them to approve, and of course now a church or a school, because both churches and schools are protected in 200 feet. Now what uh, the argument of the city was, you're giving power to this church that inherently it should not have. Because I could say, yeah, go ahead, put liquor licenses within 200 feet of us. And then next year say, ha ha, no, they can't be there no longer. And that's what the city argued. So, you know, that argument's a pretty good argument. So, but when we take this to the state level now, I, I don't see how a state statute is going to supersede the Constitution and the Religious Land Use Institutionalized Persons Act when what wasn't before the panel or Judge Walls, which will be before Judge Lawson, will be a corporate resolution made binding upon ourselves to give them in advance 15 years of waivers for as long as we're in possession of the building. And if that doesn't fly, I don't know what else I could do for the city. And I do not believe additional litigation will go in the favor of this liquor prohibition. I mean, after all, I think mothers against drunk drivers, get in touch with me. Fathers against drunk drivers. And the irony of this whole thing, I hope the, the viewers will, will get. I owned an operator of the retail liquor store in Brooklyn when my mother was killed by a drunk driver in 1981. I may have mentioned this previously. And as a result of her death by a drunk driver, I could no longer sell liquor myself. Now, when I became a born-again, spirit-filled minister, a Pentecostal, um, I never condemned alcohol or people who socially drink. I mean, if they're responsible, the evil isn't in the substance, it's in the actions. That, that, that's my personal doctoral statement. But as a liquor store owner, shutting down voluntarily his retail liquor store because of that event and getting involved with local church and raising his two children as a Mr. Mom, uh, that's what caused me to go to the church. I needed help. Um, 
here I am now, 20 some odd years later, December 11th would be the 26th anniversary of my mom's passing. Uh, here I am now being told, well, the zone you're in violated you, your church should have been able to open. But because we want to have clubs and liquor stores and alcohol being served in every single location on Lower Broadway and Long Branch, you cannot have your church. I find that to be extremely ironic. So I'll open up a liquor store, what can I say? Unfortunately, I couldn't do that because the prohibition for me to sell liquor is only upon me, not everyone around me. So um, can you... Can you explain what the Broadway Arts, because the, they make it seem like Broadway Arts District. Mm -hmm. um, I had mentioned that to, to Mr. Panday, mm -hmm. but he never kind of fleshed out why, why did okay. they feel the need to put an Arts District here, and what's their idea of that development? Is there a plan? Well, you asked if I could flesh it out. If you could, um, I, I have a tendency of being long-winded, so forgive me. I don't want to give you a lengthy litany. If you can give me pretty much what you want in the way you want, like how did this come about and what procedures were there, I, I give you as much information as I can. Well, really, I, I'm just looking to find out exactly how they decided that this was going to be the Arts District because, you know, where the Brighton is... Mm -hmm would seem fit. It seemed that, I mean, it's a good strip of land. Oh, why did they decide to lower Broadway why instead did, of Brighton yeah, Avenue the for the any, Broadway? Yeah, to, to, to reinforce what's already was there and they, t and they took out. Well, much of my answer is going to be my opinion through, sure. through actual hands-on observation because I've been a part of it since 1994, three and two, when in fact they were trying to, there was, a, there was a desperate need to do something in Long Branch. Our oceanfront had become totally deteriorated, and I agree that something needed to be done. But what needed to really be tended to was by act of fire on the pier, which burnt down, and the uh, elimination of all the attractions that went around because the pier was there that drew people to Long Branch, the haunted house, all those active arcades. There were some infamous nightclubs down here. I remember as a young man in Brooklyn on a Friday night in the summertime, a bunch of us would jump into, a, who had the license, we'd get in a car, who had the better car, that's the car we'd get into, and we'd drive down to the Jersey Shore. Well, there were two places as a young man we used to go for looking for women and, and drinking and having a lot of fun. That was the Imperial House in Seabright and the clubs that were down here in Long Branch. Um, and this is where we would come. As a young man, I used to come down here. But because of the pier fire, all that attraction was destroyed. It was gone. Economic destruction occurred as a result of property destruction. Uh, that happened in the 80s. And then Kids World went defunct. So the destroyed pier and the vacated kids world just had its tra tragic moment and no one did anything about it other than put the fire out. No one came and cleaned it up. No one fixed it up. And fact was the owners of those properties did not get along with those that were in power so there was no consensus. And as a result of the struggle between the government who people looked up to was saying, well, what are you going to do about that crap down there? And no one blamed the landowner. I mean, because the landowner would say, well, the city ain't giving me the proper permits. There was an isolated problem down here. And um, now we go to opinion. There was a very powerful man in state government at that time, Senator Lynch. Senator Lynch, this is my opinion, I own it. The disclaimer is don't blame anybody but me with what I'm about to say. This is my opinion. Senator Lynch was on a committee that oversaw, in particular, and I'm sure much more than just this, the beach club area, which is a today beach club, which used to be the armory. There was uh, a document somewhere that said if the state no longer was going to use that property, it was right on the beachfront. Um, for its armory, that it would revert back to the city of Long Branch for one dollar. Well, the upstart of the redevelopment brought certain interested people 
to a table that looked at, let's start there. So what they did then was send the city attorney, James Aaron, to Trenton to get the approval to sell off the armory property from the state directly to a man by the name of Mitchell Berlant, a developer. Now, opinion, that was the day Mr. Aaron met Senator um, Lynch and a conversation took place over that property. I'm sure on the record and off the record, much more than we'll ever know took place. Because it seems that was the pivotal, pivotal moment in time. Unbeknown to me and anyone, Lynch and Westlake had a relationship. Mr. Westlake was the tax commissioner for Monmouth County. So all of a sudden, three influential people had come together and in essence be able to make decisions, whether illegal or not is not for me to say. Unethical or not is for me to say. But those three powerful people, James Aaron of the Arrow Grimm Zarrow Law Firm, Ansel, and Senator Lynch and Jack Westlake. Now those three people too already to date have been found uh, guilty of tax evasion and corruption and you know, the FBI caught them already. Mr. Aaron is, maybe he never broke the law, who's to say? Not, you know, it's not for me to say. But that was a pivotal moment. That, uh, that beachfront was then somehow switched around with other properties and then turned on over to uh, the Promenade Beach Club folks and they put a beach club there. So that was the first portion of development. Then McGreevy comes into office Lynch has already got his eye on Long Branch along with um, Westlake and others and then all the speculators come in and Mr. McGreevy when he was governor brought Joe Barry to town with a check for the city to kick start Pier Village and Beach Front North. Um, the acquisition of these properties then became the controversy, eminent domain. So. They zoned off by law the area that they wanted to make and declare eligible. And that was, of course, the waterfront and the Broadway corridor. And then they began to name these particular zones, starting at Broadway being the T, the waterfront uh, being the top of that T. Uh, from Broadway to the north, you'd have beachfront North Phase 1, Beachfront North Phase 2, which is the Matoza area, those folks are holding out and they're fighting and they're in the appellate. Now to the south of the Broadway, where the T comes together, Pier Village 1, where they successfully moved out, Mr. Trickalese, Chickalese and Jimmy Lou, God bless his soul, and anybody who owned any of the property with a, the pier hasn't been redone yet. They put a restaurant there in Pier Village, but they still have not restored the pier. Um, but Pier Village 1 is done. Pier Village 2 is just approved. They're starting construction on that now. There will be a little further south of Pier Village 3, Phase 3, and then begins Beachfront South. And I don't know if there's a South 1, South 2, South 3, but that's in contention also. Now that's the waterfront. Coming from the center of all this, between Beachfront North and Pier Village 1, at the foot of Broadway on the ocean, is the hotel resort campus area. Coming west, there's Broadway Gateway. Coming west, there's the Broadway Corridor. Now, they designated us as redevelopment zone 6. So there is five of us, five east of us. Now, from 2nd Avenue to the ocean, that was approved in 1996. They, in 2002, subsequently moved the demarcation line west of 2nd, which brings my building into it. So all of the corridor was looking to be um, renovated, redeveloped, and was designated to do so. All that was required, much like when McGreevy brought Joe Barry in to do Beachfront North, he also won the Pier Village Award, 
Joe Barry then, of course, got a busted by the FBI. He's been to jail. He's out of jail. He's made a whole bunch of money. So there's, there's corrupted people involved with this. Like, if it didn't fact start with Lynch, Westlake, and Aaron, Jimmy Aaron being the city attorney, bringing Westlake and Lynch information or together with um, Senator Lesniak and Adam Schneider, then if you know those types of people, you got a pretty powerful group of men in state politics that can pretty much do as they see fit legally if the laws were drafted to allow them to do what they wanted to do. And that's what happened in 92, believe it or not, when they amended the eminent domain laws. See, people had more rights to say, Without a, they didn't have to sell if they didn't want to. The code enforcement could force you to redevelop your land, but they didn't have to sell. The amendment in 1992, if you and I decided, well, no, I want to stay here. I don't, I, I, we're not speculators. You follow me? See, I can see the logic on both sides of the issue. A speculator should never be allowed to hold up a project. If I'm an absentee landlord, different rights than living on site. If it's your primary residence and not your money flow project, which you're entitled to, then you know you should have the right, if you're not coming to sell it free will, then it should never be taken from you. Not in this country. Not in this country. Broadway Arts made a presentation to the city contrary to what the original design plan was all about. The original design plan was, well look, gee, Reverend Brown took 162 Broadway in 1994. It was empty for 17 years. And he renovated it. And all right, we, the church was prohibited, but he put in a retail store. Hey, now we find church is not prohibited. He can have his church. And he's willing to have a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, active, entertaining, Pentecostal-type church and community service. Why not? Let's allow it. Um, so now we don't have to worry about fixing 162 Broadway. 164, it's perfect, there's nothing wrong with it. Go across the street, look at those. There's four buildings that have just already been renovated. Mr. Panday's liquor store, brand new. Someone bought the radio station and we're fixing it. People were fixing up Lower Broadway all on their own. Market forces were curing Lower Broadway because of what was going on at the oceanfront. The persons that renovated the four buildings across the street are PAX Construction. They bought them and renovated them and filled them with their friends to run businesses and family. The Simpersteins, which was down the block from us, owned the majority of the properties on the block that we're on. They joined forces and went to the city with a plan to not only renovate their properties, because they were moving the paint store over to Route 36, to better compete with Home Depot and Lowe's, they vacated their own building. Once they vacated their own building, they created a tremendous reversal of the progress going on here over the last five years. As a result of that, they present a plan to the city, never being developers, to give us all the properties of these two blocks in this zone, and we will give you this. We got forced out. Or it's in the process, January the 3rd. Um, there's no evidence, once again, there's no evidence to substantiate why they need unblighted buildings. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, as a minister, it's difficult. You, you try to, uh, and believe me, it's a struggle for me as well, to stay humble before people. You know, I, I uh, struggle with that on a daily basis, i got to be honest with you. But I'm not asking for anyone to pat me on the back and give me a development award. We took 162 Broadway. We bought it. No one gave it to us when it was traditionally blighted. I mean, we're sitting in a building today that's just after six years of being used as a retail music store, 1,500 square feet of property. That's 10,500 square feet of usable space. Um, where above us, you could see out through the floor above us to the sky because Skylight was busted, and it rained in here for 15 years. Where you're sitting, where I'm sitting, 
there was a big hole, and we were in the basement. So that was the condition of the building. Now that's a blighted building. You can't use it. So it's a blighted building. And I think the era and the ways of the way the city went with their political arguments and the early property owners that don't, I, I really don't know why they couldn't come to mind. Is it because they wanted too much money? Or is it because one was a Democrat and one was a Republican? I mean, you know, these things sometimes are decided because of those silly differences. Um, quite frankly, um, we took the property. We got sweat equity volunteered to us. We raised money, put money into it. We brought it back from the dead, from blight, and, and now they want to take it from us. I think that's, you know, wrong. Um, so they fleshed out this plan with their friends. And I don't think it's going to. I don't think it's going to be victorious as we challenge it. You know, it's difficult for the individual person to decide to fight city hall. It's expensive, not only financially, emotionally. Just use me for the illustration. We bought the building in 1994, and we were operating for four years across the street. All we wanted to do was what we already had been doing for four years in our own property. And someone somewhere said, now that interferes with a future plan, so let's not allow it. And someone had to have said, I mean, I don't think idiots are running City Hall all the time, every one of them, would have had to say, you, you're going to be violating the organization's religious freedom. You're going to be violating the minister's religious right to free exercise. It's a constitutional battle. Someone then had to analyze that. And someone did then have to say, Brown? He's got four dollars in his pocket. His organization, all right, it's growing. And people are finding him charismatic and interesting. But that's easy to fix. Let's make stories up about Brown. Let's get Brown in compromising positions. Let's destroy Brown's name. So what was the kind of character assassination that they... Uh uh, uh, started. Well, you're asking me to make public things that most folks have forgotten about, so that's a pretty interesting uh, double-edged sword. But um, well, the financially, I was three years of zero revenue. Okay, and as a result of the organization having zero revenue, I couldn't pay any of the debts that were accumulating for the mission, and I certainly couldn't pay myself, and I certainly couldn't pay my bills. So was I a deadbeat in many areas? Like, yeah, I fell behind on my credit card bills. I fell behind on my utility bills. We were being charged taxes on the building because we weren't given use as church. Um, we had a lawyer who refused to go and apply for tax exemption, even under controversy. We uh, had a lawyer that we actually had to sue for malpractice, and we settled that case out, the details of which I can't mention. But, uh, well, I guess the best way to answer your question is when Seward decided to buy Alaska, it was Seward's folly. Until some time when um, man caught up to nature and technology where they could see a vast amount of resource in Alaska, and Alaska was no longer Seward's folly. It's a preserve today where there apparently is enough oil where we don't even need to buy any more foreign oil. So the, the lighthouse mission was Brown's folly, just merely based on the fact that they didn't hand me use. But did I go to jail? A number of times. I was arrested for a number of things, all of which were uh, manufactured and were, of course, disposed of appropriately. But when, once you are arrested in your community, even if you didn't do anything wrong, the papers tend to like to work along with the powers to be. So for four full days, the community read, Brown in jail, Brown in jail, Brown in jail, Brown in jail. Big, bold, Bodini headlines. 50 points in some cases. The sub, 35 points. Blah, 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 blah. Why Brown's in jail. Then you come out, four days later, it's not on the front page, eh, page 18. Brown's out. Then, within a year, two years, grand jury or whatever decides, 
There's nothing here. He shouldn't have been arrested. Vindicated. That's on the... Well, they don't put it on the last page because the last page is just as good as putting it on the... They'll bury it somewhere. He was arrested, but he was innocent. He shouldn't have been arrested. Uh, now, people will then say, well, why don't you sue them for false arrest? Hey, you know, I had this one big lawsuit going on. Um, yeah, but that's a tactic. The point here is this. People know this. And that's why many people won't run for public office. That's why you have the corrupted running for public office. Because they've, they're insulated. They don't have feelings. You know, like, you know, they can put their hand in the cookie jar, and there can be chocolate all over their faces, and just standing there. The cookies are gone. You didn't see it. But there they are in front of you. You ate the cookies. No, I didn't. Look at me. I'm charismatic. I won my election. How could I? No, I didn't eat those cookies. You have no proof I'm innocent. So... Well, the, re the main reason why I wanted to bring that up was not to kind of drag up the past, mm -hmm. but specifically because as a model for other people that are dealing with eminent domain, because, you know, you were dealing with, like, the, co the case we just covered in Jersey City was a bunch of primarily middle class and upper middle class artists that, okay. were, that, that were primarily white moved out then you look at the eminent domain issues that are going on in Harlem right now and then you're dealing with, yeah. exactly and then you're dealing with primarily like working class middle class black mm -hmm. then down here you know it's the idea to show that there there's a corollary in the dynamic and the tactic that's used over and over again oh and I totally agree with you and based on that alone um, if I would have had to be paying up front for the, the first of all, the Department of Justice does not charge to do legal work when it's protecting the Constitution. So Can I ask you, because you had mentioned the, the uh, Department of Justice a number of times, how much did the DOJ help? And, like, you know, what would you say about, what would you tell somebody, how would, let me take that back, how would they approach, how would you tell them to approach the DOJ? Well, there's a, a, there's a, a method uh, online or by phone and mail to where you can contact the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Um, and tell them what you believe your civil rights violation was. And then, of course, they'll decide if they have the resources to send a U.S. attorney to handle your case. There was a similar violation of uh, Sister Janet Christensen's Epiphany House here in Long Branch in the 80s. And she was fortunate enough to get an attorney from the Department of Justice to handle the whole thing. Um, my name at the time was already mud by 2000, that the Department of Justice found me in all honesty when I approached them. I believe they found me a little too controversial to get into. I mean, I wasn't Bishop Smith in Trenton. I was the Reverend who, you follow me, of the what, the, what we call the low church. So the discrimination against the low church is, is phenomenal. Now, for Mr. and Mrs. Joe Smith, or for Bruce McLeod, who was abused on the eminent domain here in Long Branch, you know, you contact him, I'm Bruce McLeod. Okay. Are you related to that guy in the movie uh, Highlander? No. Oh, okay. Because how else would you recognize the name MacLeod? So, and, of course, it's a federal agency, and I have nothing but good things to say about it. Um, so they did not take my case. They took other cases. They'll take a case... It pretty much, um, it has national consequence. When the Ralupa law was passed, they came back and revisited. I had already retained counsel at that time. And they monitored the case and assisted local counsel for me and did a lot of the logistical work for us. They were very, very helpful. And they wrote briefs in support of us at the appellate level. But beyond the DOJ, um, we approached like the Alliance Defense Fund which is involved with the Ocean Grove thing. And uh, they told us that um, 
they didn't have the time of day for us. They just had other cases that were more important to deal with. And that's okay. I mean, no one's saying anything's wrong there. There are others, Pacific uh, Justice League, the Liberty Council, I called CBN, until finally the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty uh, listened to me. And um, RELUPA was passed, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, and they became staunch advocates and supporters of the RELUPA rights. In fact, they run the RELUPA.com. So because our case was, in fact, one that if it, wasn't mis if it was mishandled, by uh, an attorney. I mean, when you're poor, you're at the liberty of legal aid. And if you can't even get legal aid or a public interest law firm, you're going to get, if you're fortunate enough, uh, an attorney that you'll be paying, will take $125 an hour. But I go, what did General Ashcroft get? He's getting, what, $850 an hour to investigate some major financial thing. Why do I even bring that up? Well, when you're paying $125 an hour, that's the type of service you're going to get. When you're paying $850 an hour, that's the kind of service you're going to get. At the hearings in Trenton um, Thursday, you heard mayors and high-powered lawyers, Wilenz, Goldman, and Spitzer, speaking on behalf of the right to continue to seize property for development, economic development where you heard basic citizens like Harold Barbaro, who was at the last person to testify at the hearing, who is a retired pharmacy clerk, I, I guess. And he's, you know, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So I was fortunate. But even though I had a local lawyer, he had to cut his teeth on much of this. He wasn't an expert in any of this. And it's probably why it's taken seven years to a point. You follow me? So the poor, no matter what the issue, the poor are always abused. You know, I'm brother, regardless of color, regardless of creed, or regardless of national origin these days. You know, those, I find it very interesting. I asked a mayor who uses eminent domain a lot and supports the use of it supports the use of it against the Anzalones and against the elderly folks in our community, the Vendettis, who've been there for 50 years, which that to me is an abuse, more so than what they're doing to me. I believe that's more of an abuse. And I said to him, would you do that to your mother? He said, yes, I would. And you know, I walked away from him. Now, don't, don't shrink. Don't shrink. He's not saying he would be cruel to his mother. Because there's a negotiations process here. So I'd go to mom, or he'd go to mom, because I couldn't do it. He'd go to mom, say, mom, listen, we need, I know we all grew up here, we need this. I'm your son, we need this. But mom, guess what? You're going to get $15 million out of this, and this is how you're going to get it. And the mom is going to say, but honey, I don't really want to go. I remember, you know, I breastfed you in this very room. And he's going to continue to work on his mom, but make sure his mom is not abused. She'll be moved up and out, and they'll get to do what they want to do. Now, that's why they can easily say to you, sure, I would use eminent domain against my mom. Because the area such as problematic is how much literal control remains in the hands of the city council, the development council, the mayor, and everyone involved, the developer, in the process. At any given moment, they could walk through this door and say, Reverend Brown, you mean to tell me you're going to turn down $100 million for this building? I have to sit there and look at them and say, gosh, that's 50 missions opening within 30 days, 60 and 90 days, with budgets of $2 million apiece. Um, but you follow the point. You know? But when the property on the open market could fetch $1 million and you want to give me $355,000 um, because some guy who you paid to do an appraisal on our property says it's only worth $355,000 and that guy has given you political donations each time you ran for office, how that gets an enormous amount of credibility over 
Well, the building next door to me went for a million. The building across the street, 950. The building next to me, 1.4. How can I be worth 355,000? More important than that, what can I get for 355,000? Can I get up, out of the way, you rebuild, and give me back 10,500 square feet? for 355,000? No, you can't. And that to me, I think, if they're gonna, if, they, if we need it, if we need eminent domain for economic development purposes, they make us the partners in that economic development. Draw us into willingly sell to you our property. Define who a speculating holdout is and who a property owner in love with its property and its community are. Because I guarantee you, the reason why they love their property is because of the community they're in. The community makes house home. Within your four walls, you could make yourself home. But if outside isn't pleasant, you're an isolationist. And people need to really rally around you to encourage you to embrace everything around you. So I can safely say that it's the community that makes an individual love and cling to its home and property and business. Now this is an interesting situation. We're a church, it's a business, and it's my home. And from time to time it's home for many folks who otherwise would not have a home. I'll say that on the record now even though it was in violation of the C1 zone. Um, we've helped people in any way we can. First of all, I think it's every property owner's right to be hospitable to anyone who has a need. But the, I don't think these problems are so difficult that resolutions can't be allowed. Like one, for instance, separating who's speculating and who truly is a property owner. If I know some states that have reversed the complete takeaway, if you've been there for 25 years, you're treated differently than if you were there for the last 25 months. You follow me? You know, they declare these areas in need of development, like you asked your question, which I never fully answered, I just responded to. But the culmination of that plan comes as a result of five local elected officials looking at an ordinance or a resolution, bringing it up on an agenda, bringing it back at the next meeting, because the notice has to be in the paper, and then a hearing is to take place, second reading, a hearing, and if you have 25 people get up and say, vote no on this ordinance, vote no on this ordinance, vote no on this ordinance, I ask your viewers a question. What should those elected officials do? They should vote no. In this particular town, for this particular plan, if 25 people get up to speak about that ordinance, and 20 said vote no, and 5 said vote yes, but you look at the 5 that said vote yes as having jobs in the development, or as well in the city, then of course, you have to weigh who votes no, who votes yes. And when you weigh who voted no, then you have to decide to vote no. But in Long Branch, you could get 30 people up against it, and if they want it, those five want it, and it's development, they're gonna vote for the special interests. They're not gonna let the people have their way in this issue. And it's, that's how they passed the redevelopment law. These five people, and it's Mary Jane Selling, David Brown, well, no longer um, John Zambrano, because John Zambrano last year was popped by the FBI for taking uh, bribes to facilitate no-bid demolition contracts. Anthony Giordano, who actually works for a bank, whose bank did a lot of the funding of the redevelopment. I don't know how the hell they got away with that. Oops, excuse me. Uh, and Michael DiStefano, who's been council president now for two years because he just likes to run roughshod over the people. He's put a five-minute rule on us. He dismisses us when he doesn't want to hear what we have to say. Um, 
then of course there's Adam Schneider, and these folks have been in office for the last, uh, well, since the redevelopment, 1994. Um, and um, they just do what they're told to do, I guess. Uh, I certainly couldn't take so much property. I mean, if it was truly a speculator. I mean, if it was someone just trying to abuse the circumstances. And I knew that every other building around them was taken fairly for $1 million. I would then give that person the million dollars like everyone else got. Unless you can show me there's 24 karat gold in your pipes, then, oh, you know what? Hey, it's worth a lot more. And if you got platinum doorknobs, you're right. There's a value to them. So you could package them up and take them along with you or... See, and I don't want to sound like I'm a, a, a supporter of eminent domain, but I'm trying to keep an, om, an open mind and not condemn um, the rebuilding. Words. Excuse me? I said, sorry to interrupt, but I said interesting choice of words. You didn't want to condemn. Yeah, I don't want to condemn the rejuvenation of an urban city. You know, I, I don't want to sound like there's never a need for the use of government to make a hard decision. I mean, deciding to go to war, that's a hard decision for a person in government if you have a conscience. Uh, and then, you know, if you, well, gosh, if you boil us all down, um, if we're not putting people in elected office that have a conscience, I guess that, that's where the problem can start. And then there's the ego of man. I mean, may, maybe it's not so surprising that the Reverend who came into ministry as a second vocation, um, is in the middle of this, who has an open heart and an open mind and not a condemning doctrinal philosophy. Um, you know, it's interesting when you look back at the history of mankind, um, great societies that pre-existed us, their fall always began with the eroding of personal liberty and civil rights. And if that's what's about to take place, you know, then these are the signs that we're to observe. When churches and synagogues and mosques, and I mean, this country was founded, if I remember correctly, in my history that I was taught at St. Brendan's Elementary School in Brooklyn early on, and then on to Severian High School, that um, we're here because there was uh, no liberty where we all were in Europe, or in Africa, and you know, there was slavery, and it was all these, the Irish, I mean, I'm, my ancestry goes into Ireland. And um, I used to listen to my great-grandfather and my grandfather as a little boy about uh, all they had was potatoes to eat, and it's a joke today. But put yourself into that place and time. Technology, video, movies, you guys like Mel Gibson, who does Braveheart and brings back some of these you know, events for us to look at today and analyze, which took place hundreds of years ago, to see where the struggle was over America and, and how we took this nation. I mean, wounded knee. Come on, let's let's get right to the right to the point of why the municipal governments are doing this still in the state of New Jersey. It took 90 years for the actions of wounded knee to be reversed. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled it was wrong. It was a wrong seizure. It was a wrong taking, and that they. Lakota Nation was awarded, what, 91 million, I think, and the Lakota Nation is standing on principle. Well, it's easy for them. They get casinos like that. We can't. <laughs> but they won't even take that 91 million. Um, Paul Town, recent history, 21 years ago, Michigan, they took, a, they called it Paul Town because mostly Polish people lived in that area. Was it easier to pick on Polish people than wasps in that area? Did uh, someone decide, you know, that's the area to put this General Motors plant in? Let's wipe out its churches, its schools, its homes, its everything. Take it away. All of Paul Town. Gone. Took 20 years for the courts to decide. That was a wrong taking. So here, you know, Adam Schneider and the city council looking at all these issues. Unless they're really idiots and no one's come to them and said, the decision you're going to make about Brown in 1996 is unconstitutional. You'll violate his rights. A lawyer then says to him when he asks, what's our options here? Well, we can make life pretty miserable for Mr. Brown or Mr. Smith or Mr. Jones. 
We can, in fact, delay a decision of a court for seven years, and he may not even still be here. It's only by miracle I remain, to be honest with you. I can take no credit for getting to this point. In the last minute, can you just kind of wrap up what you would hope? Because when we talked about, when we talked last, it was like uh, we had asked what you would hope that someone else would do. Now I'd just like to know what, as a man of faith, what you believe that you have the strength to do to kind of get through this. It's a very good question. Um, and I find it sometimes very difficult to talk about what I think I should do for me. The issue is still bigger than me as far as I'm concerned. I've been left totally dissatisfied with finally, if I am vindicated, let, let the, my public around me know and let me know that because they did violate us, they did kind of take 13 years of building a momentum away from me. I'm 55 today. But as a man of faith, if I believe God brought me to this day, he's going to keep me to this day, physically, emotionally, spiritually, economically. Um, I think what's fair and what's reasonable is task one on my short list. If the city sits down, and works to rebuilding the dignity they took away from me with rumor, innuendo, and lies. I'm a generous man, so I mean, I give to people in need. If the city is truly in need of the property, I, I think terms can be established, but it, it shouldn't be at force and without free will, and it should be twice as much as it's worth. I think a formula is twice as much as it's worth. But if there is a rally of people now, fighting alone is a hard thing. If a number of people walk through 162 Broadway, which I'm opening up Monday morning as a haven for the civil rights issues, and there's a lot of people asking me to stand up for them and fight with them, I'm going to fight on. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Sit down. Tell me about it. <laughs>